Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. <laughs> Good morning again. This is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. This morning, it is June the 10th, 2013. And as I mentioned every particular week, this program is designed to give the guests a chance to give their life story. Every now and then, we will get in a particular topic. Today, we're kind of going to balance it out, but mostly get into a particular topic or a particular agency. I have uh, this morning as my guests the Senior Vice President of CBIA, Joe Brennan. Good morning, Joe, how you doing? Morning, Jonathan, thanks for having me on. Okay, uh, you're welcome. Okay, first of all, could you kind of let people know uh, where did your life pretty much get started at? Uh, sure, I'm f actually from upstate New York. Uh, I was born in Troy, uh, just north of uh, Albany, and I grew up in a little town called Cohoes and then moved to another town called Latham, which some people here are familiar with, traveling through, going up to uh, Saratoga, wherever. Went to high school in Schenectady, um, and then uh, after graduating from high school there, I went to Massachusetts. I went to Holy Cross College in, up in Worcester, mm -hmm. got a degree in political science there, and then right after uh, college, I went to law school in Boston at New England School of Law. Uh, make a very long story short, mm -hmm. ended up down in Connecticut, uh, practiced law for a, a few years, but was always interested in doing something different. I was, uh, as I said, I got a, a degree in political science. I'd always been interested in government and politics. Uh, so I decided to make a career change and uh, started working for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, CBIA, mm -hmm. uh, almost 25 years in uh, September will be my 25th anniversary there. So I spent most of my time as a staff lobbyist and then uh, and moved up the ranks, spent a lot of time working with our member companies, trying to represent them before state government and try to make Connecticut a better place to locate a company, do business and create jobs. Okay. I just want you to briefly introduce, you know, your background to let people know you're definitely qualified uh, for this position that you have. And it's a very important position, I think, um, personally, as the senior vice president of public policies and of the Connecticut Business Industry Association. Uh, first of all, what is the Connecticut Business Industry Association? Well, CBIA, it's a statewide business group. Uh, we represent about 10,000 companies all across the state of Connecticut, from the very largest companies down to small operations with one or two people. And uh, we've been in existence almost 200 years. If you trace back our roots uh, in uh, 2015, it'll be our 200th anniversary. And you know, our mission is pretty simple. It's to create a business climate here that encourages companies to invest and grow and create jobs here. Uh, as you know, in this day and age, you can locate a business anywhere and be successful. Uh, so we want people to choose Connecticut to invest here, uh, put their operations here, create jobs here. And uh, that really benefits everybody in the state. Obviously, everybody wants a good job where they have some, uh, some mobility, make a good, uh, good wage, good benefits. And it also produces revenues for the state of Connecticut to fund very important services. Mm -hmm. uh, we also provide a wide variety of uh, benefits. Uh, we actually have operated uh, a private sector exchange. Everybody's talking about health care exchanges now uh, after Obamacare was passed and exchanges are going to come on later this year. Uh, but we've been operating a private sector exchange for uh, almost 20 years now, uh, insuring tens of thousands of people in Connecticut through a, a plan that I can get into in a little bit more detail later, if you like. Uh, and it's been very, very well received by our members. Uh, we also provide uh, other benefits. We produce or uh, purchase energy for about 800 companies in Connecticut. Uh, we have telephone consulting services for a lot of small businesses can call up and get uh, get some help on navigating their way through some of the difficulties in doing business in Connecticut. But our main mission is to represent our members before state government. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say members, like 10,000 members, are that just direct individuals or that's 10,000 companies that you're talking about? Uh, it's individual companies. Uh, some of these are larger that have a lot of uh, 
divisions or separate companies underneath their umbrella, but it's individual companies. We don't have a membership based on individuals, but based on companies. Some of those are just individuals if it's a sole proprietorship. We have a lot of companies that are very, very small, maybe a partnership or a limited liability company with just one or two employees. And as I said, it really runs the gamut from that type of business all the way up to the largest uh, industrial corporations, banks, insurance companies, financial services. So we really got members uh, of every industry in every size and in every location across the state. Mm -hmm. And the locations that you consist of obviously is the 169 cities and towns that exist in Connecticut. Yeah, we actually have some members that are out of state, uh, generally larger companies that have concerns. They do business in Connecticut. They may not be located here, but they do business here and they're concerned about the public policies in Connecticut. Uh, so we do have some companies that uh, are out of state that belong to our organization, but the vast majority of them are Connecticut based businesses. And, you know, what we try to do is uh, really foster those types of industries where we create wealth. Uh, manufacturing, our roots go back, uh, as I said, almost 200 years in manufacturing. Manufacturing is important because most manufacturers in Connecticut export their products outside the state of Connecticut. So you're basically importing wealth. You're bringing wealth into the state and that's how you grow your economy. Mm -hmm. Same thing with large financial institutions, insurance companies, pharmaceutical, research and development type companies. You don't just want to trade the same dollar back and forth. You want to import wealth. So. Those are the types of industries we really try to foster in Connecticut because every industry benefits from that. Estimates are that for uh, every manufacturing job, up to four jobs outside of manufacturing are created, uh, service type companies to help support those manufacturing jobs. So uh, as I said, we're across the state, uh, every different size of, uh, of company, but uh, we really try to focus on those that, that help us grow our economy. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, you're, excuse me, um, yeah, Joe, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'll call you Joe for short. Uh, okay. Joseph is actually a, a full name. Joe is fine. Joe is fine, okay. You are actually a lobbyist, don't you? Is that really part of your job as well as the senior vice president for right. public policy? Yeah, I'm a registered lobbyist. I have been for 25 years. Uh, we have a team of people, uh, a very qualified and dedicated team of people that uh, are basically full-time at the legislature when they're in session. Uh, dealing with all kinds of issues that come before the legislature. And when the legislature is not in session, they're dealing with uh, all kinds of issues that confront our members through other agencies of state government, Department of Labor, Department of Revenue Services, Department of Environmental Energy, uh, Energy and Environmental Protection, pretty much across the board. So we year round are representing our members. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, we have a team of lobbyists. I'm still a registered lobbyist. I do spend a lot of time at the Capitol, but it's not my full time job like it used to be. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the Connecticut Business Industry Association has been around for 200 years? Uh, not under that name. Okay. Uh, several iterations over the years and ultimately a merger between a manufacturing association and a statewide chamber of commerce created CBIA. Mm -hmm. Has they changed their uh, criteria over the 200 years even though the name has been changed? Has their policies, anything has changed over those 200 particular years? Well, the mission is certainly stayed the same. We want companies to invest and grow here, create jobs here. So that's our main mission. But certainly the types of products and services that you may offer certainly have changed over time. As technology develops, uh, we try to use that technology to uh, find ways that we can serve our members better. As I said, we didn't used to have a program where we actually purchased energy for between eight and nine hundred companies but because of uh, an online procedure that we can use now partnering with other companies we purchase energy so we're always trying to adapt uh, we don't want to just stay the same organization not that we were 200 years ago but that we were 500 years or five years ago we've really got to adapt and change in order to stay relevant for our members mm -hmm. Now, with your industry and association, could you kind of project pretty much where Connecticut will be going at over the next five to ten years? Uh, maybe not five to ten years. We do a quarterly economic survey of our members. Uh, we talk to purchasing man managers, people that hire, or unfortunately if they have to let people go. So we have a pretty good snapshot of where the economy is going generally over the next year or so. Looking out five or ten years, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, and right now, it's particularly difficult because there's so much change. Uh, after we went through the basically the meltdown on Wall Street, really had major repercussions in Connecticut because we rely so heavily on financial services in Connecticut. So there's still fallout from that. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier about Obamacare coming online more fully in 2014. Uh, that could have impacts on hiring in Connecticut, at least over the short term. So there's a lot of unknown factors. Plus, we're dealing with a state that has not really grown its economy. There was just a, a recent report by the Bureau of Economic Advisors, um, uh, economic analysis talking about the fact that Connecticut is the only state that didn't grow its economy in the last two years. So mm. we've got a lot of real challenges facing Connecticut. Uh, competition is stiff. Our members get recruited by uh, states, uh, particularly in the South and in the West in this country, but also from other regions around the world to relocate their businesses. Uh, we're fighting against that every day, trying to say Connecticut's got enormous opportunity. Uh, we've got a great history. We've got world-class companies here in Connecticut. We've got a great workforce, but we've got to do a better job of putting all the pieces together so we can stay competitive. And our our goal is certainly that we'll be one of the top economies in the country five to ten years out. Okay. Well, I hear a lot of the criticisms about Connecticut is that the tax burden or the tax structure is one of the worst in the country, and the uh, regulations or the energy. Uh, policies that Connecticut has is really one of the worst. Are those valid criticisms for uh, Connecticut? Well, you know, everything, Jonathan, is uh, is pretty complicated. When you look at tax burdens, it really depends on what you're talking about. When you look at overall tax burden, because we do have the highest per capita income in the country, that our overall tax burden, looking particularly at federal taxes, is is high. There's no question about that. When you're looking at individual taxes and how it falls on different people, our state income tax has a lot of credits and exemptions at the low end of the income scale, so a lot of people aren't paying any income tax at all. Uh, when you look at the upper end, although our rate is, slow, is lower than uh, a place like New York City, our top rate of our income tax, the base is different on which you put that tax. So in many ways, you're paying a higher tax in Connecticut. On the business side, it really depends on the type of industry you're in and what tax you're looking at because businesses not only pay a corporate tax, but they pay sales taxes, uh, certainly income taxes for all employees. And then depending on what how you're formed, if you're a C corporation, as it's known, a traditional corporation, you're paying a corporate income tax. But if you're not a C corporation, or if it's known as an S corporation or a limited liability company, the partnership, sole proprietorship, you're paying the tax on your business income through the personal income tax. So. Overall, uh, certainly the perception is uh, that Connecticut is a high tax state, and, and I think the reality is such in many instances, not in all instances, but in many instances, it is a, a high tax state. However, uh, that really isn't the biggest issue for Connecticut. I think the biggest issue is that our costs across the board are among the highest. It's not just taxes, but our healthcare costs are among the highest, our energy costs are among the highest, our labor costs are among the highest. So when you put all that together, Connecticut, depending on the survey you look at, might have the fourth or fifth highest cost of doing business in the country. Some surveys might even show it higher than that. Mm -hmm. So that makes it difficult. Uh, and it's not that you can't overcome that. A lot of our members will say, look, I will, I will deal with the costs. It's a lot of the other things, the regulatory burdens or some of the, uh, the threats that are coming from other legislation that might make it even more difficult. Uh, you mentioned energy costs. That's certainly an issue. Um, uh, the legislature has just passed what was known as the Comprehensive Energy Strategy that will hope to look at uh, diversifying our energy sources a little bit so we can uh, bring costs down over time. And, and on the regulatory side, uh, that's been one of the big complaints from businesses uh, over the years at Connecticut. It's just more difficult to do business here. Regulatory burdens are greater. More red tape here. It takes longer to get a permit that you might need to operate your business. Mm -hmm. And we're working with various agencies to try to streamline those processes and bring them down. But we've still got a long way to go. Well, Joe, you kind of pretty much work with the businesses and the industries that's already in existence. You don't really directly work with a startup company that's trying to start a business or grow a business? Uh, usually not directly. If we get inquiries from uh, individuals that are looking to start a business, we'll do everything we can do to help them. A lot of times they'll be pointing them in the right direction to work with uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development. Uh, or another uh, group called CERC that might provide some resources to them. Uh, put, uh, let them know about the various permits or licenses uh, that they may need in order to operate a business. So we'll do as much as we can. We're not necessarily set up to do that. Mm -hmm. However, as I said, our main mission is more to provide services to existing companies 
than to represent them before state government. But we'll do anything. You know, business, Connecticut needs as many businesses as it can get. If we're aware of somebody that wants to start up a company, we'll do whatever we can do to help them out. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear a lot of reports that from, I believe, 1950 to 1990, Connecticut was one of the best states in the country for business. All of a sudden, going into the recession that we had in 89, going into 90, up until this point, uh, Connecticut has been one of the worst states for business. Is that kind of still accurate or some misleading reports towards that story? Well, I think there's some truth and in, in, in some misleading things to it. Uh, you know, even during the good times, there were some really difficult issues. I wasn't necessarily around working at CBIA in the in the 70s, but I know there were some very, very difficult issues that, that made it difficult to compete from Connecticut. But overall, we, we did pretty well. Uh, I think there's a lot of factors that go into to what has happened. Uh, certainly globalization, I think, has been a good thing for the world and a good thing for this, this country opening up markets around the world. But if you're in a high cost place to do business, globalization can, can have its downsides. It just makes it more uh, apparent to companies on, uh, that they can produce their product or deliver their service more cheaply if they're located elsewhere. So just from a competitive standpoint, I think just in the time I've been at CBI over the last 25 years, uh, competitively, uh, it's much more difficult now. Uh, there's so many other places that are trying to attract you. They'll build a plant for you. They'll train your employees. They'll buy your machinery for you. Mm -hmm. They say all you have to do is pick up and, and move to Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, wherever it may be. Uh, so those are things you have to fight against. Uh, we've certainly had some issues relative to public policy in Connecticut. Uh, back in the early 90s, there were companies that were leaving Connecticut because of the cost of workers' compensation insurance. And we were able to pass a couple of bills in 1991 and 1993 that helped level that off a little bit. Uh, from a state budget standpoint, when I first started at CBIA, the budget was between six and seven billion dollars a year. Now we're over uh, 21 billion. So we've seen a major, major increase. Some people will say, well, that's because the personal income tax uh, was passed back in 1991. The reality was back in 1991, uh, things were very, very difficult. As you mentioned, we went through a really tough recession in the late 80s, early 90s, and state government was pretty much tapped out from every revenue source. Um, so this, the uh, personal income tax was put in at the same time we put in a cap on spending and, and made other budgetary reforms to try to get some control over, over government. But the reality is the legislature has not done a particularly good job in controlling state spending growth. Uh, yes, we have a lot of needs out there, but if you push the burden so much uh, that people decide it's no longer uh, affordable for them to live here, or competitively it's no longer a good idea to have a company here, it makes it very, very difficult. So we've got some real challenges in Connecticut. There's no, there's no doubt about it, Jonathan. Well, you mentioned about the affordability for just your employees to live in this state. And Connecticut could be one of the most expensive states to actually live in, particularly a good quality of life. Um, if you say a base decent apartment in some areas of Connecticut, Fairfield County could run over $2,000 per month. Doesn't that kind of affect your employees or the members of your uh, Connecticut Business Industry Association? Uh, there's no question. There's no question that with recent graduates from college, uh, they want to buy a home. They find it's much cheaper to buy a home elsewhere, and particularly if they have a better chance of getting a job elsewhere. Uh, those people end up leaving. I've heard numerous stories over the years, particularly down in Fairfield County, as you mentioned, where an employer may recruit an employee from, let's say, the Midwest. They come out here, they get <laughs> sticker shock when they look at the cost of housing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a real issue. Um, you know, and it's not something that's easily changed. You can't just pass a bill at the legislature and make houses more affordable. Uh, but through a lot of things that different organizations that work around affordable housing are doing, hopefully we can uh, combat that. But at the end of the day, if you have a thriving, growing economy with opportunities for people and a great education system to match up people with th those, uh, those opportunities, then I think you're going to be successful and people will be able to afford to live here just as they have in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, you just mentioned something about education and Connecticut seems to be one of the worst states for, I guess, disparities in education. Um, you have probably one of the best educated uh, states in the country for quality of life issues. But when you look at the gaps between your urban and your suburban districts in Connecticut, it seems to be one of the worst. 
does that also affect businesses uh, decisions to look at Connecticut as a state to grow and expand that's a great question Jonathan and you really hit the nail on the head with a lot of the problems that are facing the state particularly from a, an employment standpoint workforce and education standpoint we do have what's known as the achievement gap which is the gap between upper and lower income and how they perform on, on standardized tests. We have the largest gap in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could talk the entire hour just about that issue. Uh -huh. um, but just in sum, uh, there have been some good uh, pieces of legislation uh, passed the last couple of years to uh, increase, uh, uh, raise standards in high school several years ago. And then last year, the governor uh, had an initiative that we supported and many other organizations supported uh, under uh, education reform to really change uh, the way we educate kids in Connecticut with a real focus on uh, children in, in urban settings. Uh, one thing I can talk to you about that some of your viewers may be interested, uh, we were asked uh, by uh, superintendent at the time, Stephen Adamowski, uh, to help as he divided Hartford High into uh, career academies. And we were asked to work with some of our members to develop the, uh, the uh, curriculum for the Academy of Engineering and Green Technology at Hartford High. And if you look at the transformation in that school and the transformation among many of the students, uh, just because of more hands-on focus, uh, you know, and really raising the bar for everybody. A lot of times people think, well, if you're from a certain uh, income group you can achieve mm -hmm. and these kids are showing that you can achieve given the proper instruction so we've got uh, a lot of kids that are coming out of that program that are the first in their family to get accepted into college and it's really uh, just been a great experience for us to work with uh, th these students and the principals and teachers and uh, people from companies that are all lending assistance so you know, we're very bullish on uh, what can happen in Connecticut with the right policies in place. And we know over the long term, that's the only way we're going to maintain the great quality of life that we have here in Connecticut if we improve education standards for everybody. Because nobody you know, should be left behind. Maybe it's a cliche nowadays about no child being left behind. But mm -hmm. there's really no excuse in this day and age for uh, every child not to get a great education and have great opportunities as they get out of school and move into the workforce. Well, uh, Joe, is public, the public school system throughout the state that you have is really the main problem when you get into education from a K-12 through standard, or is there other factors that's really hurting our educational attainment in this uh, state? Well, I think everything needs to be improved across the board. There's been a lot of focus over the last couple of years, or last many years, really, on uh, early childhood education. Uh, I think some of the problems in the public schools is that some kids were coming into school just not prepared to learn. Mm -hmm. Some kids get a really good quality preschool education. Other kids weren't, were getting no preschool education at all or maybe a, uh, less than a quality uh, education. So there's been a lot of resources put into beefing up. So um, hopefully children in any community across the state can get a really good education starting at three years old. So when they go into the public school system, they've, they've got that ability to learn. So that's one area that needs to be addressed. And uh, we've begun to make some progress in that, in that uh, regard. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, there was a bill just passed last year. And one of the key components of that was to really focus on those underperforming schools, public schools in Connecticut take the worst performing schools based on grades and the, it's called the commissioner's network and the commissioner department of education will move in with his team and really look at what do we have to do to improve the quality there. Mm -hmm. So it's really focusing on those that need the most help. I think that's a great thing. It's going to take some time, but hopefully we'll see progress in those schools. Uh, but really across the board from preschool through higher ed, I think all those areas have some uh, aspects that need to be improved. But this is probably the biggest single focus we've seen on education in a long time, and hopefully we'll start to see those improvements. Well, there's magnet and charter schools going to continue to be the sound bites of the solutions that if you can't really help the public school systems in time enough of a process to get kids in a position to be properly educated, that you take the best kids in the public school system and you put them in a charter school system. Are you thinking that should be looked at differently than the way it's being um, advocated? Well, I think charters and magnets will always be a part of the solution, uh, but it's not necessarily taking the best kids. A lot of these schools just have lotteries. They take whoever they take, but they do show really good results. So, uh, But it's certainly not done in a way to hurt the public schools. 
the only way we're really going to be successful if we make all schools successful, whether it's a magnet school, a charter school, a traditional public high school, the, uh, the trade schools, whatever it might be. We've got to find ways that make all these schools successful. If we can find different models that work at magnet schools or charter schools and bring those models into the public school system like many people have tried to do and some have done successfully, then that's only going to improve the public schools. Uh, certainly our position has never been uh, just to focus on charter schools or magnet schools uh, to the detriment of the public education system. We're only going to succeed as a state and maintain our quality of life if we make our public schools the best in the nation. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, do some of the companies that's part of your membership tell you that they have a hard time finding trained and qualified employees to fill certain jobs? No question. No question. It's probably most uh, critical right now in what's known as advanced or precision manufacturing. Uh, again, I could talk all day about manufacturing because uh, I, I think it's so important to the state and so many great things going on in the state of Connecticut around manufacturing. But we hear from uh, companies all the time that they're having difficulty in finding people with the skills to come in and run sophisticated machinery. And you might think with an 8% unemployment rate, it wouldn't be hard to find people. But uh, some people that have skills have left the state of Connecticut, but many have just retired. Uh, even years ago, uh, we found through some surveys that the average age of a machinist in Connecticut was between 55 and 60 years old. And that was, you know, over a decade ago. So a lot of these people are retiring and we just don't have the same influx of young people moving through the pipeline to fill those jobs for a lot of different reasons and this gets discussed in, in policy circles all the time that a lot of people don't want their children to go into manufacturing because they don't understand what modern manufacturing is it's not you know the, the maybe the dirty jobs or the same job it was decades ago but it's sophisticated now they're clean jobs you really got to be bright to, uh, to work in manufacturing you're, you're dealing with computers and computer driven equipment uh, but for different reasons in Connecticut uh, we haven't seen the same focus that you might see in some other states because people want to go on to get advanced degrees and in law, medicine, accounting, whatever it might be. So we spend a lot of time working with other organizations and with government to try to get into schools, to get into high schools, get into middle schools and educate students as well as educating t teachers and principals and administrators about the great jobs and the great opportunities that are available in manufacturing and we're starting to see some progress there but it's uh, it's a critical need right now for for people with skills to move into advanced manufacturing. Now, does capital workforce development kind of work in some of those areas to try to get people who are not properly trained or educated into the type of industries that would be most beneficial to them? Uh, yes, they do. There's a whole network of different organizations, you know, from the federal government through the state government, through local governments, private organizations, public organizations, all kind of working, it's not the smoothest system uh, in the world, uh, but around workforce development. I'm not an expert in that area. I can't uh, give you all the specifics of it, but uh, you know, there's been a critical need for uh, some streamlining and that I remember even back in the uh, O'Neill administration uh, having discussions about streamlining some of the different agencies involved in workforce development. Uh, and a lot of people have uh, they're towing the water a little bit in, in this area, but I think it's one of the areas that we continue to need uh, to focus on because, as I said earlier, the, the real ability of Connecticut as a state to be successful economically and the ability of our companies to be successful competitively and economically is really comes down to our, the quality of our workforce. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why we've succeeded over the years and it's going to be why we succeed in the future. So everybody pulling together to make sure we have the best training programs out there is really critical. Okay. Well, Joe, I know you're not an economist, but maybe you might work with economists, so you might be able to answer this question also. Uh, some of your cities and towns in Connecticut has some of the highest unemployment rates. The capital city right here is over 15%. It's the highest in the state. Uh, Bridgeport is very high. Um, other cities like New Britain and East Hartford is very high. Then you see some very successful cities like Stamford and Danbury that's very low. Uh, does the Connecticut Business Industry Association try to work towards helping some of the cities reduce their unemployment All right. Well, Jonathan, what we do is try to look at policies that will help do that. You know, we just are not equipped to work directly with the city of Hartford on that. There's other organizations that do that, whether it's Bridgeport, New Haven, Waterbury, whatever. But what we try to do is focus on policies that will make it easier for companies to locate 
in a city. A lot of that has to do around property taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that has to do about workforce. A lot of the issues that we've already talked about. Um, there's reasons why companies, you know, choose to locate in a suburb and not in Hartford or New Haven or Bridgeport, Waterbury, whatever, New London, whatever town you want to mention. Okay. So we try to address those things. Uh, we've worked a lot over the years on trying to reduce the property tax burden on companies uh, that are located in, a, in an urban setting. Uh, we work a lot on workforce issues. Uh, we work a lot on almost anything that makes it more difficult. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of years on regionalism, mm -hmm. trying to, instead of just pitting one town against another, trying to get towns in, a, in an area to work together. We have councils of government, uh, which I think are, are fairly effective in getting the towns to work together, but we don't necessarily have policies that enhance that. So it's just, and, and towns, you know, recruit companies to, you know, move from this town to this town or rebate your property taxes. Uh -huh. It makes it difficult for a city like Hartford to compete. It's not to say the city of Hartford couldn't do more or hasn't, you know, maybe done as much over the years to make it conducive for companies to locate here. But we've still got, you know, a base of companies here, largely around insurance and financial services. We've got a lot of small businesses in the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's a big, big challenge to reduce that unemployment rate, but I think ultimately, over the long term, it comes down to the issue we were just discussing, and that's education and uh, job training programs. Well, I was just going to say that because if you look at most cities like Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport, they seem to have a lot of people that come into your downtown and work. I mean, I don't know exact the exact numbers of people that actually work in the city of Hartford or New Haven or Bridgeport. I hear sometimes it could be over 70,000. So if you have 70,000 people that are working uh, that don't live in the city, that certainly can't help the tax structure of the, of the city when you have more people taking the tax base out of the city. Uh, and obviously regionalizing Hartford could be a solution, but how does the legislators look at that issue that most people that work in your downtown or your cities like Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport just don't live in your city? Well, I think one thing they're trying to do is better coordinate housing policy, education policy, uh, economic development policy, and transportation policy. So you really look at some of your core centers and try to build off some of the strengths that you have. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we've got a lot of uh, towns that compete against one another. Uh -huh. uh, so what we're trying to do and what a lot of policymakers are trying to do is better coordinate a lot of the existing resources so you can start building your economic development off your transportation hubs. So if you're taking a train into New Haven or into Bridgeport or ultimately a busway into Hartford or maybe light rail into Hartford at some point, that you start building your economic development off that. Uh, we spend a lot of time dealing with brownfields, mm -hmm. uh, those properties that are oftentimes in these urban centers that are old industrial sites that have no productive use anymore because they need to be cleaned up and it's very, very expensive and a lot of liability around the cleanup. So each year the legislature has passed a brownfields remediation bill, which makes it a little bit easier, a little bit more affordable to remediate some of these uh, dirty properties in these uh, urban centers. So there's a lot of different policies that are starting to come into place. Uh, the new Speaker of the House, Brendan Sharkey, he's big into regionalism and trying to, uh, you know, make a city like Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, New London, uh, the focus of your strategy around your economic development. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I, we just can't succeed as a state if communities have, as you said, 15% unemployment rates. You know, you may have pockets of success, but you're not going to be successful as a state unless you educate people better and provide them good opportunities. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, none of these things are easy solutions, particularly at a time of limited resources. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see any great solutions over the short term, but if incrementally we can start to tie our transportation, our economic development, our housing policies together, hopefully you'll start to see some more investment in the urban centers. Well, what about social services? Is that being classified now as an industry uh, that you have in our state? Because that seems to drain a lot of your budgets when you're talking about social service. So how would you view social service in our state? Is that like an industry now that we have? Well, I mean, you can call it an industry. It certainly uh, has grown over time. Unfortunately, one of the realities of 
um, just the way things work is that when you go into a tough economic time, as we've been with several recessions in the last decade, in a very, very deep recession, that that just causes more people to rely on government services. Mm -hmm. So at a time, maybe you would like to shrink government so you can put more resources into the private sector. You've also got more demands on the social service agencies because more people out of work. Okay. As I said earlier, we've got, you know, historically Connecticut's had an unemployment rate somewhere in the neighborhood of 4%. Mm -hmm. Right now we're at 8%. And when you factor in people that have maybe given up looking, some people would say it's much higher than 8%, as you said, 15% in the city of Hartford. So there's just more demand on government programs uh, for people when they're having trouble finding work. Mm -hmm. So that causes the social service industry, if you like that term, to, to grow. Mm -hmm. It's always trying to find a balance. You certainly want to provide good services to maintain that quality of life here in Connecticut. But if you focus so much on growing government, which I think we have in Connecticut, focus so much on that, and maybe less uh, attention to the private sector, growing your private sector economy, you end up in a situation where we are right now, where our economy has actually shrunk over the last two years instead of growing. Mm -hmm. Now, some would argue, and the report that I referenced earlier said part of that is because of shrinking on the government side. And, you know, we do have some number, I don't know the exact number, fewer state employees than we had a couple of years ago, but also we've had layoffs at the two Indian casinos. And under the way things are recorded, those are recorded as government jobs. Okay. So there has been some shrinkage on, shrinkage on the government side, but the real problem is we just haven't seen the growth on the private sector side. And unfortunately, some of the policies in Connecticut don't necessarily help that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's people promoting the government taking even a larger role in provision of health care and provision of uh, of pension benefits taking a, a greater role in things that the private sector you know does in Connecticut and we've got world-class companies providing those services here in the state so I think we really need to focus more on growing our private sector economy if we can do that then you're gonna have less reliance on social services because you put more people back to work mm -hmm. well the only problem I have Joe is I haven't seen any evidence of that in your urban cities for a very long time of lowering your tax structure. And I think you also have to deal with crime, too. I think many of your urban cities have a high crime or a perception of a high crime, and that deters a lot of businesses from really looking at investing their business into urban cities. Um, but you take a city like Stamford. I know they have very close proximity to New York. But what are they doing that's making companies like NBC Sports and other corporate companies from New York uh, move into that part of the state? Well, historically, uh, it was a lot of companies in New York looking for a change. Uh, they wanted to get out of the city because, as you know, New York City's had its up and downs over the years. And for a lot of times when those companies were being recruited, New York was going through some real problems. Mm -hmm. People were looking for a little different environment and a lower cost of doing business. The one you referenced, uh, NBC Sports, that was a little different. That was the state you know, as part of the governor's first five program. Uh, putting together a package of incentives for them to come here. Uh, so it's a variety of things. Uh, you know, going back into the mid-90s, we saw a lot of jobs, insurance jobs, financial service jobs, leaving the city of Hartford. Mm -hmm. Legislation was passed at the time that basically gave camp companies a tax credit for the property taxes they paid on all their computers. That was something that was done to try to keep more jobs in the city. Uh, we haven't really done anything since then uh, very aggressive in order to um, to deal with some of the issues that, that you that you mentioned. You did mention crime. I think that's a, a good subject to talk about. Um, one of the things that we have focused on over the last couple of years is crime from the point of uh, the Department of Corrections is one of the biggest drivers of state government. Okay. What can we do to lower the recidivism rate? Uh, we've looked at through some of our members what other states have done on different programs that they bring into the prisons to try to work with people. Now, now some people are going to end up in jail again, but we really think that a lot of people, given the right uh, attention, the right programs, uh, can change their, their way and go back and find a productive life in the private sector. Uh, so we've been working on various task forces and commissions at state government to try to reduce recidivism rate. So you're reducing the crime rate when you do that. If we can find ways to get people, find them good opportunities in the private sector working, 
uh, and staying out of prison, that's going to obviously help them, help the crime rates in the cities, and help our overall cost of running the corrections department. So a lot of these things are being looked at, but as I said, there's no easy answers and there's no quick answers. So mm -hmm. there's attention to a lot of the things that you mentioned. Unfortunately, just a lot of them take time. Well, do you think every now and then when you have incidents like Newtown, what took place and, you know, a crime spurt in some of your cities, then you have community forums and people come together like police chiefs and mayors and governors. And now they start to try to hear from the people that live into these uh, environments what they think would be the um, solutions. And one thing I think I heard at the last community forum when the governor and the police chief and the mayor here in Hartford was looking at that the box, I guess, on the right-hand side for many um, ex-felons uh, that's coming out of prison, that when they go apply for a job, should that uh, felony on the box side be removed? So when an employee asks, have you ever been convicted of a, of a felony? If that was to be removed, and now they could be more in a better position to get gainfully employment, does that sound like a starting point towards reducing crime when these ex-felons can now get a better chance of getting into the employment sector? Uh, yeah, let me first say I'm not an expert in this area. Okay. Uh, I can talk a little bit about it. <clears throat> I don't spend a lot of time on it. But um, I can say that uh, through working with the Sentencing Commission, some other uh, task forces at state government, we've looked at a lot of these issues. Uh, unfortunately, the timing wasn't right this year. We were supporting a couple of pieces of legislation that would make it easier uh, for people coming out of prison. Um, and again, I, I don't know all the particulars on this, but a certificate that you can get in order to help go get a job. Uh, there was also legislation dealing with uh, trying to get parole for some people that committed crimes when they were youthful offenders, uh -huh. um, but maybe not eligible for parole now to try to give them a second opportunity. Uh, because of the kind of don't can't be soft on crime environment in the legislature right now. We weren't able to pass those bills. Hopefully they'll come up next year and we will be able to do it. But um, I don't know if you know the name Bill Dyson, but Bill Dyson is a former legislator from the city of New Haven. And he's really dedicated a lot of his life uh, to trying to make it easier for uh, people that did make a mistake early in their life, uh, that did spend time in prison to come out and be able to find gainful employment. Uh, and we've worked with Bill and others on some things like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't have all the answers for you, but I do know there's been more attention on uh, trying to meet the needs of companies that are having f trouble finding people. Mm -hmm. If you can take people that can, can be trained and have the particular skills that are needed and make it easier for them to transition to the workforce, I think that can be a win-win. But, Joe, you just mentioned if companies are having a hard time finding employees to fill certain jobs and you have a lot of high unemployment areas throughout our state, shouldn't there be some type of common ground now that we can kind of work with the people that have the most difficulty getting into the employment sector with the companies that have the most difficulty filling uh, positions? Is that something that we got to start to work as a partnership? Yeah, it seems like it would be a no-brainer <laughs> uh, to get that match up, but it, uh, it's it's – over time, it, it seemed to be a little difficult in order to get that, that match where you have a, a job that's open, you've got a person looking for employment, uh, how can you match them up better? Yes. A lot of it is around training. Mm -hmm. You might have people that are chronically unemployed just because they don't have the educational background or they don't have the skills that are needed. And it's expensive to train people, particularly to go into precision manufacturing or some of the other jobs that I talked about that are open. Uh, they, they can't just take anybody. They need people with skills. So I, I think there's a better focus now on trying to match up uh, the people that are looking for work with those that are looking for employment. And But the, the critical part in the middle is that training program, whether it's in a community college or a standalone training program, uh, wherever it may be, that they can get the training that's needed so they can move into that open position. Mm -hmm. Well, do you see a very... Um not say easy, but do you see a working partnership with the legislative that we have here in Connecticut on many of the issues that the Connecticut Business Industry Association advocates for? Well, I, you know, to be honest, I think it's a good news, bad news thing. I think certainly uh, among some key people, uh, there really is that partnership, uh, a real uh, awareness that Connecticut's got some significant challenges facing itself right now. 
and we need to address those together if we're going to be successful. Uh, but there are still some key people in the legislature that, you know, kind of rail against business. They rail against corporations. They think government can do things better. And that's holding us back right now because I don't think we're going to be successful unless we're all pulling in the same direction. And we talk a lot, you know, we're a nonpartisan organization and we talk a lot about trying to do things in a bipartisan fashion in the legislature. A perfect example, unfortunately, it was a tragedy that triggered it, but back in uh, November, December, the legislature was working on what's known as a deficit mitigation package. The, the current fiscal year that we're in had a deficit last uh, December and legislators were trying to find a way to solve it. And then Newtown happened. Uh -huh. And then right after that, legislators got together, Republicans and Democrats, and said, we can't waste a lot of time doing partisan bickering here. We've got to come together and solve this problem so then we can focus on gun violence, school safety, other issues. Uh -huh. And they, they put together a uh, deficit mitigation package in a bipartisan fashion that solved the problem at the time, didn't raise taxes, and created some goodwill. Now, going into the full budget year, it's always much more difficult to have a budget's done that way, but at the end of the day, we get a better result if people work together. And right now, I think things are very partisan uh, in the legislature. Uh, we've got a gubernatorial election uh, next year, and things generally get more partisan as you get closer to these statewide elections. But at the end of the day, I think we're all served, better served by the legislature if they can take the best ideas from both sides of the aisle and come together. And just if they take the best ideas from the business community and the best ideas from the labor community, the environmental community, whatever, and try to work together. We just haven't seen as much of that as we need to see. Mm -hmm. Well, does that ever even bother you personally? I mean, to the time that you have to bring that type of personal conflict to yourself and just block it out when you know that they're not going to be willing to even sit down and reason with some of the ideas that you have? Has that ever come up about in the past? Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, I'd probably say the best way to summarize my job over 25 years has been incredibly rewarding, uh, but uh -huh. also incredibly frustrating. Uh -huh. uh, and the rewarding side comes from working with so many uh, men and women that work in, in businesses in Connecticut. Um, you know, sometimes the business community doesn't always have the, the, the greatest reputation, but the companies that are based in Connecticut are just world-class companies. They care about their employees. They care about their communities. They pay good wages. They provide good benefits. Uh, they care about the policies that are, are, are affecting them. They care about the legacy that they're going to leave for their, uh, their children, their employees' children, and then they just care so much about the state and their communities. So when I go up representing them, you know, I've got a lot of passion mm -hmm. for what they're trying to do. And, and when you meet a lot of resistance, uh, you know, for occasionally legitimate reasons, but sometimes reasons that I don't think are legitimate, um, that's where it gets frustrating. And yeah, you've got to kind of put your personal feelings aside and continue to advocate on behalf of, of your member companies, in our case, uh, the best way that you can. And a lot of that is trying to just bring that business person and the policymaker together. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of plant tours at manufacturing locations where we'll bring a local legislator. He may not be, he or she may not be familiar with a company in their district. We bring them through where they can meet the company owner. They meet the employees. They see the employees are happy. Like some of the perception in the capital sometimes is, you know, employees are miserable. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. Vast majority of employees in Connecticut like their job. They respect their employer. Um, it's a good environment for them. Um, so the more we can do to kind of break down the misconceptions that policymakers often have about business, the more successful we can be. I would say over the 25 years I've been there, <clears throat> one of the things that I think has changed, not in a good way, and maybe it's looking back, you always think, you know, hindsight's always great, but it seemed to me that people were a little bit more open-minded and you could actually move a legislator by making a good case. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we have a lot of legislators that come up uh, with a certain mindset and a certain ideology. And no matter how effective you are or how good a case you may state, they don't move. And they may even say, say to me sometimes, you know, you may be right, but I'm still voting this way. Um, they, they just come up with an agenda 
they may be part of some uh, special interest before they came to the legislature, mm -hmm. and they just don't seem to be as open-minded and looking at the greater good. And I'm certainly not talking about all everybody and, and probably not even a majority, but there's still a lot of people up there that just are not looking at the greater good. They're only looking at one particular aspect of life in Connecticut. And I think we're only going to be successful if we can look at what's good for everybody, not just for CBIA and our members, but what's really good for everybody in the state of Connecticut. Well, unfortunately, that sounds like the many people are just closed-minded or they're not open-minded enough to look at everybody in the big picture. Uh, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, and you know, there's people smarter than me can come up with all the reasons for it. Some mm -hmm. may have to do with uh, money in the system. Uh, some may just be there's more organizations that are represented at the legislature now, so-called so special interests. Uh, but again, I just have found that a lot of people, um, again, just have a kind of a mindset that they're on, a, on one side of the divide or the other. Mm -hmm. instead of being in the middle and being convinced on which may be the right way to go. Not that people don't come up with values and beliefs. They yeah. certainly should. But I also think you can always uh, educate yourself more. There are certainly things that I don't know about, and I constantly am confronted with issues where I have to learn more. Mm -hmm. And as I learn more, I might change my perspective on it. And I'm just suggesting that there are some people in the legislature that don't necessarily change their perspective as they learn more, or they choose not to learn more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's working to the detriment of the overall body. If we can have a little bit more openness and a little bit more focus on the big picture and what's really best for the state as a whole, you know, I've often made the argument and I've made it, you know, in public hearing testimony that in some ways the economy, the state's economy has turned into a zero-sum game at the legislature, meaning if somebody wins, somebody else has to lose. Yes. If business wins, labor loses. If mm -hmm. manufacturing wins, the environment loses, you know, whatever it may be instead of really working on win-win solutions, which I think you can. Mm -hmm. Because if your economy grows, yes, businesses will be successful, but so will individuals because they'll have more jobs and more job opportunities and hopefully better job opportunities. The state wins because it's got more revenues coming in to the coffers to help pay for, for services. Uh, and I just don't think we've seen as much attention, again, not through everybody, but certain, certain segments of the legislature. Mm -hmm. Well, some people say, and I don't know how you feel about who's ever sitting in the seat of the governor, that John Rowland was very successful with trying to change how Connecticut was operating. He made some serious changes with the uh, welfare to work policies. He tried to devote a lot of money to certain cities with uh, development. Um, does it really make a difference now who is the governor? I'm not trying to criticize, have you criticize the governor one way or the other. But doesn't that play another role when you're talking about legislative-wise? Well, obviously, it makes a huge difference who mm -hmm. sits in the governor's chair for a lot of reasons, not only you know setting the overall policies for Connecticut, but also for appointments through the agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, because the legislature is only in session a certain amount of time, okay. uh, five months one year, three months the next, unless they're in special session. But companies are dealing with state agencies every day, mm -hmm. you know, year round, whether it's the tax department, environment, labor, the bank's department, if you're a bank, uh, whatever it might be, there's, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of state agencies and, and companies deal with many of those agencies all the time. So it's really critical that you have the right people uh, running those agencies. So the, the governor obviously has enormous power. And I think every governor that I've been fortunate to, uh, to work at CBIA during their terms, uh, whether it's Bill O'Neill or Lowell Weicker or John Rowland or Jody Rell or uh, Dan Malloy, uh, you know, all bring certain strengths mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, in my opinion, some weaknesses, some weaknesses yeah. uh, to the job. Um, you mentioned John Rowland, and certainly he tried in a lot of ways uh, to really reach out to the business community, you know, to find out what's working, what's not working, and try to change the things that, that weren't working at the time. He did, uh, I think, partly maybe coming from the city of Waterbury, that he did have a real singular focus on cities mm -hmm. and trying to put some investments in the cities. And uh, certainly Governor Malloy has spent a lot of uh, his tenure in office talking about uh, the need to grow our economy, to get companies to, to grow here, uh, beefing up economic development programs. And one of the things that, you know, we've often talked about, we thought one of the, the best things he has done is really bring some new people into state government, you know, kind of went outside the box 
in a lot of his appointments to different uh, agencies that we work with, whether it's the Department of, uh, of Education or Energy and Environmental Protection, Economic Development, Tax Department, whatever it may be, he's got really good people running these agencies, mm -hmm. uh, and that's helpful as we try to make it a little bit easier for companies to do business in the state. Mm -hmm. Well, does it help that the Connecticut Business Industry Association is a very powerful agency and has a lot of influence with your a membership that you can go to the legislative and really be a voice? Well, we certainly hope so. You know, we've mm -hmm. always felt that the uh, strength of our organization is through uh, our members. Uh, the fact that we represent so many uh, member companies that represent, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees in the state, that that, you know, hopefully gives you a certain amount of clout. Uh, if any of your viewers <laughs> think that makes it easy uh -huh. and that people just kind of fall down when CBIA walks in, you know, that's not the case at all. Okay. Uh, everything is a challenge. Every little bill that you're dealing with is a challenge, um, you know, which is fine. We don't shy away from the challenge. Uh, we just, uh, again, I wish it was a little bit more recognition that focusing on the economy is good for everybody and mm -hmm. not just for the business community. Um, but yeah, I'd like to think that uh, if whatever strength we have uh, really comes through the strength of our membership, we've got, as I said, I can I get very passionate in talking about our members mm -hmm. um, because I spent a lot of time with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies over the years, uh, seeing how hard they work and again, how passionate they are for their communities and for their employees and for the state. They uh, not, you know, it's so hard to run a business as you can imagine in the state of Connecticut, but then also to devote a certain amount of time that they do to all the community projects. But then on top of that, to get involved with an organization like CBIA, come to the Capitol to testify at, at public hearings, come to the Capitol. We do Connecticut Business Day every March where we get uh, about 400 business people taking time out of their day to come to the Capitol, meet with legislators. Just a few weeks ago, we do what's called Manufacturing and Technology Day at the legislature, where we do a little mini trade show in the Capitol building. We had about 45 companies come up and spend the day talking about products that are made here in the state. Uh, they send letters, they send emails, they make phone calls, they go to meetings back in their district. They really devote a lot of time because they care so much about the state. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to ask you one last question because, you know, you did an excellent job this morning coming here providing a lot of information. And we could talk a lot longer, but I just want to get this question as a very important question. Do Connecticut have the luxury of writing off many of the 169 cities and towns that exist in this state? And have Connecticut actually done that? Uh, when you say write off, um company or towns that are going through financial difficulties yes um, you know it's been done on occasion uh, you know Bridgeport over the years has had its issues uh, financially uh, city of Waterbury is probably the most prominent in recent times where the state had to move in but that that has happened rarely mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of discussion and you've mentioned 169 towns a couple times and yes. I think that's a really a good point because Connecticut is a very small state geographically. I think mm -hmm. we're the third smallest in the country, but we've got 169 towns packed into a very small state, and it, and it, it certainly has its advantages. Uh, we hear a lot about home rule in Connecticut, the quality of life here, having the little, you know, bucolic suburb with the church steeple and all that, but from a policy standpoint, it does make it a little bit more difficult when you've got towns competing with one another, uh, or more importantly, in our perspective, um, having their own list of services and not doing as good enough job of sharing services. And that makes it more difficult for them to succeed financially. And you hear a lot of complaints from people that run cities and towns that they constantly have to look at, you know, bringing in more development to drive up their grand list in order they can pay for education, pay for school. So it's not the best system in the world, but it's a system we have. I don't see it changing. I don't see, uh, you know, towns consolidating, uh, mm -hmm. but I do see uh, really out of, uh, out of necessity towns coming together and do more regionally over time so we can share services, maybe share revenues from different projects uh, so we can work cooperatively. I think the leaders of the cities and towns and the ones that I know are really great people that do a great job. I think they recognize that they really got to do more regionally if they're going to be successful. Okay, well, that's going to be actually the last words, and I appreciate, uh, Joe, you spending your time coming down this morning, giving a very honest and accurate educational viewpoint on Connecticut Business Industry and Association.
Uh, again, this is Jonathan Small. I enjoy doing this program uh, this morning. I tell you every single week. You can watch other programs on accesstv.org. As I say, everybody should keep the faith and have a very blessed day. And until the next time I see you, uh, just enjoy yourself and make the most of it. Thank you.